So today, I'm going to give my talk on uh, Web3 due diligence. And just a quick agenda. Um, we'll start with an introduction of myself and Certic. Talk a little bit about why due diligence is important and especially unique and challenging within Web3. Uh, give an actionable framework for evaluation, some tips and tricks, uh, as well as some methodologies that we use in-house at Certic, and then go through some case studies on what can go wrong. And then finally, talk about uh, how Certic is building out some products and services that are aimed to help uh, investors and institutions within the space. Uh, so quick intro about myself. I am the head of insights and due diligence at Certic. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Certic, we are the largest uh, cybersecurity company in the Web3 space. We primarily are known for our security audits, uh, which is a review of the code before it's deployed on chain. But we also have um, a team building out lots of different products. So we support security sort of end to end within the Web3 lifecycle. Uh, we focus kind of across the spectrum, work with projects across all ecosystems, all categories within crypto, whether it's DeFi, NFTs, gaming, um, you name it. So, uh, quite a lot of visibility and experience within the industry, especially on the security and risk side. And so I think one of the things that we've learned um, over the years as a security company working in the Web3 space is uh, doing due diligence in Web3 is, is very unique and it brings about some unique challenges that you don't have in Web2. Um, in the Web3 world, a lot of teams are anonymous and they're global. Uh, it's smart contracts, once they're deployed on chain, they're immutable, so they can't be changed. And you know, in the Web2 world, if you have a cybersecurity incident, it could lead to a data breach, maybe some downtime on your website. But in Web3, if you get hacked, it could lead to tens of millions of dollars in irreversible damage, right? So just different orders of magnitude um, when it comes to risk. Uh, also in Web3, you have a situation where you have liquidity before product oftentimes, right? And that creates some misalignment for investors, misalignment for teams, and some unique situations around there. And then there's also a very unique role around community, right? In, in Web3, community is everything. And uh, I think it's something that people often overlook in their due diligence process. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned, uh, risk in Web3, it's not just very high, it's also existential. Um, in 2022 alone, there have been over $2 billion in losses across hacks, flash loan attacks, exit scams, rug pulls, um, you name it, right? So, you know, a, a project can be doing extremely well and then overnight uh, just disappear because of this risk. And I think, you know, for the audience, I'm sure you all are investors, institutions, enthusiasts, whatever it may be, I think it's very critical to bake these assumptions into your models and understand where, where these categories of risks lie when doing your due diligence. Um, oops. So yeah, there's this uh, quote from Ray Dalio that I really like, and he's talking about uh, digital assets, and he says that in a time, uh, at a time where cyber offense is much more than powerful than cyber defense, cyber risk is a risk that I can't ignore. And I think a lot of institutions and investors have started to feel this way. There's a lot of uh, you know, lack of clarity. There's a lot of fear when it comes to investing in Web3 and understanding all of the risks that are associated with that. And so you know, to the extent possible, I think as we've learned in the industry, having worked with thousands of projects and seeing all different types of incidents, um, that you know, we can hopefully offer some actionable strategies for how to assess these categories of risks. So I'm going to offer a very simple framework that investors can use. And it focuses across five different categories that we think are the most essential in the Web3 due diligence process. Uh, the first category is the team. So teams you know, are important whether or not you're doing due diligence in Web2 or Web3 or any type of world, right? Um, but there are very special risks in Web3 teams uh, that, that, you can't, uh, that you can't ignore. Um, so the first bucket is really understanding like team member risks. So whenever you're working with a team, you know, a lot of times investors have feelings, you know, they don't want to invest in anonymous teams or they're more okay with investing in non anonymous teams. Um, you never really know who's behind the scenes, right? And you don't know uh, whenever you're working in a DAO model or in some sort of like distributed anonymous team environment, you don't know if the person behind the scenes has any sort of past criminal history, if they've been involved in other types of crypto projects that have ended up, uh, you know, rug pulling or being an exit scam. 
and that presents a lot of liability to you as an investor if you don't do that level of due diligence to understand you know, behind, who's behind that. Um, there's also an engineering risk. So what we've seen a lot in Web3 is that the core team is non-technical, right? So they're you know, either coming from a finance background or arts or gaming or whatever the case may be, and they may be very solid, but their engineers are you know, contractors hired off Fiverr or uh, you know, people that they just don't know um, that aren't very adept to the technology and the tool set. So you know, a lot of times we see very solid teams, but when we look at their technical quality, it's extremely poor, and it all comes down to the fact that they have very underqualified developers. Uh, you know, there's not really much tech development. Um, their developers or like the technical team may not understand all of the technology that's needed to be built out, right? So like the smart contracts are just one tiny layer of like the product lifecycle. You still need a front end, back end, kind of all the core engineering services. And a lot of times we realize that teams don't fully understand that, even though they might have a good concept or a good story to sell. And then finally, there's reputational risks when associating with teams. Um, there's a ton of adverse media, especially for Web3 builders that have been around for a long time, right? You can dig deep into the internet and see a lot about a person's background, and a lot of times investors don't know that until after an investment is made public or you know, something of that sort. Um, there's also a lot of increased regulatory impact, especially now with OFAC sanctions coming across Tornado Cash. So as an investor, you have to think about you know, when you're associating with these teams, who, you know, what, what reputation do these teams have and what, how can they impact your uh, investment in business? And so some actionable tips we have here. Um, performing KYC and background checks on teams is something that we always recommend. Even if the team is anonymous, there are services now that have been uh, presented where it preserves the team's anonymity, but it just does a quick check to verify like this person is legitimate, they don't have any sort of criminal history, kind of all that uh, good stuff. We also recommend performing technical team evaluations, so just understanding you know, who is the core technical advisor and then having uh, you know, just a very informal discussion with someone who's technical on your side as well um, to understand you know, where is their skill set, are they actually part of the core team, Do they actually, are, will they actually be able to deliver on what they're promising to deliver. And then finally, for reputational risks, we recommend open source investigations. So uh, you know, a lot of this could be really just Googling the names of the teams, kind of digging deep into the web, examining their social profiles, going into their telegram, understanding what their discourse is like, what are their behaviors like. You know, it's when you're in a pitch with a founder, it's so much different than how they behave uh, with their team or in the field. So this is something that uh, we recommend, you know, doing very diligently. And then there are also services that can go through and perform these types of uh, checks for you as well. So a case study where this went wrong, um, there was a DeFi project known as Wonderland that was super popular at the end of 2021. I'm not sure if any of you uh, remember that or were affiliated with it. Um, it was an anonymous team, and it was discovered that the CFO of the project, who was super prominent, was actually connected to a $170 million exit scam of an exchange known as Quadriga in Canada. And uh, this tanked the project overnight, hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, token value lost, uh, project dissolved, investors uh, you know, got crushed, and uh, it, it just wasn't a great situation. And the crazy part about this is that his own team didn't know his identity, right? So they were in a DAO, they all had anonymous identities, and it just so happened that the CFO of the project who was handling all the funds uh, ha had this sort of background, right? So, you know, massive existential risk, and this isn't the only time that this is taking place, but I think good case, st case study for, you know, how things can go wrong if you don't know who's behind the scenes. Moving on beyond the team, uh, next is security. And so this is what we specialize in at Certic. Um, as I mentioned before, security is an existential risk in crypto and something that uh, as investors is a lot of times more difficult to understand because it gets very technical and you don't really know, you know what do they need to do, what do you need to check, what do you read in a report. Um, so some of the big risks, uh, first category is code flaws. And so this is just like if they make a flaw in their smart contract and it can be exploited, right? You know, this is something like in logical error, so they intend to do some sort of mechanism, but the mechanism doesn't work as intended. Um, there's also just coding errors that take place, right? Kind of uh, as they would anywhere else. Um, kind of the next bucket is around key mismanagement. So 
you'd be surprised at how many smart contracts are actually heavily centralized. You know, there's this misnomer that Web3 is decentralized, but almost every single smart contract that we audit has a significant number of privileged functions. These privileged functions are controlled by private keys. And so understanding how those private keys can impact the project is going to be critical, right? So you know, a lot of times hacks take place because they're leaked or compromised private keys. Um, a lot of times if a project is heavily centralized, it could be like a rogue team member, uh, you know, just a lot of risks associated with that as well. So something uh, important to look out for. And then finally, there's uh, third party dependencies. So um, you know, even if your code is sound, your project is sound, your private keys are secured, if you're integrated into an Oracle, for example, and that Oracle gets manipulated, uh, that could affect uh, your project, as happened uh, recently with a lot of exploits. Um, and uh, there's also the risk of like exchange token hacks, right? So if your token's on an exchange, uh, what is that exchange's level of security? And then all of a sudden, if that exchange gets hacked and then they start dumping your tokens, then that could impact the price of your project even without any sort of intention from your end. Um, so first and foremost, we always recommend uh, every single project have audits, and we also recommend penetration tests. So for those who aren't familiar, audits are uh, Web3 specific, so it's a review of the smart contract code before it gets deployed on chain. After it gets deployed on chain, you can't really change it theoretically, so uh, it's very critical to do that kind of before the fact than after. Um, as an investor, it's always important once you're going through the process of investing to understand, you know, has this project been audited? Who have they been audited by? And you know, if not, like, do they plan to get audited? And you know, how, how seriously are, gonna, are they going to take that level of investment? Penetration testing is more of like a traditional Web2 cybersecurity. So that still accounts for everything like your front end, your back end, your mobile application. right? These are all kind of still exploit vectors, even though the smart contract could be solid. Uh, next is having a multisig with an incident response plan. So a multisig helps protect the private keys. It requires that multiple team members kind of sign off on any sort of transactions. So in case the, uh, you know, one team member gets compromised, it doesn't affect the centralization of the entire project. And uh, incident response is always critical too. You know, if they do, they have any sort of backup plan if something goes wrong, if team member, you know, goes missing or so something, right? How, how can they deal with that? Uh, and then finally, active monitoring solutions. So as I mentioned, audits you, typically they're done before the contract is deployed on chain. But after it's deployed on chain, there are also some additional kind of security vulnerabilities that you can't really detect before it's deployed. Um, so that's where real-time monitoring is important. And you know, there's a lot of ways that you can do that that I can get into shortly on uh, you know, how Certic has built out some products related to that. Um, so there's a famous uh, security leaderboard within the crypto space known as RECT. And on the RECT leaderboard, you can see all of the largest uh, hacks that have ever taken place within uh, the crypto space. Um, you can probably see that there is one thing most of them have in common, which is that they're not audited, right? And uh, you know, this is audits aren't perfect processes, but they're essential and um, can most of the times give you a level of assurance, especially if you have multiple audits, uh, that there is some level of security taking place. Um, a, a specific example of where security goes wrong is Axie Infinity, the extremely popular. Uh, play to earn game. So they raised $150 million um, late last year. And then early this year, uh, their bridge was exploited for $600 million, uh, effectively wiping the treasury, um, treasury funds for the team, right? And uh, the crazy thing about the Axie exploit actually was that it was a private key compromise. So there was nothing wrong with the contracts or anything. Uh, it was more of like a traditional Web2 security hack where they got the private keys and then once that took place, uh, they didn't actually notice that the hack happened for five days after the hack. Um, so that's where we say like active monitoring, being on top of these solutions, understanding whether these teams are taking security seriously uh, is critical because in this case, unfortunately, it was not. The next bucket I'll talk about is technology and specifically starting with ecosystem risks. So whenever you're investing in a project, you're also investing in their ecosystem. And what I mean by that is, you know, what layer one are they kind of primarily deploying on or layer two blockchain? You know, if, if that layer one uh, is promising, has a community, has traction, then that's likely a good sign. If they don't, then as great as your project or use case can be, it may not, it may not do well, right? So um, really understanding where, 
where that layer one or layer two that they're deploying on is, and then also what are the inherent security risks behind that layer one. Uh, you know, there are certain layer ones that oftentimes have like downtime and that affects the projects uh, in, in significant ways, right? Or they might have some massive security exploit or if they're a new layer one that hasn't been tested or audited, you inherit all of those security flaws yourself. Um, next is around code quality. So not only is it important to understand uh, like the smart contract code, but all the, the rest of the code that the team is kind of building out and as I mentioned before, you know, what, is, uh, what, what is the level of like, sophistication that their engineers can actually take in building out a product? Um, so you know, it, it may sound silly, but a lot of times Web3 teams, you know, they may be expert engineers within the Web3 domain, but beyond that, they just uh, you know, fail to be actually build out like, good products and use cases. So understanding you know, where do they live in the product lifecycle, how is the functionality of their product, do they do they actually understand how to build use cases that are gonna uh, you know, create like actionable things for users to use and gain user adoption? That's all very basic for a Web2 investor, but in Web3, it's something that a lot of times is overlooked um, and potentially detrimental. So uh, we recommend doing a lot of diligence on the ecosystem level. Um, first and foremost, understanding what is that team's strategy? A lot of teams have like a multi-chain strategy, so they'll deploy on many layer ones, but they might have like a primary one and then some that are more like secondary. So as an investor, it's good to understand these things and then go perform your diligence in that ecosystem. Uh, it's important to look on chain if the product has been launched to understand, you know, is the product functioning? Is it gaining traction? Is it actually working as intended? Um, and then looking and doing some MVP and usability testing yourself, right? So whenever they uh, share a product or even if it's a mock-up or a concept or whatever, right, is it, you know, is, is it functional? Does it seem like they actually have kind of the intended use cases in mind? Um, a lot of times the risk is not so much at the code level, but it's in how they design the mechanisms and that could lead to user error, user loss of funds, all that, and that's just really not great for a project. Uh, so a use case of when ecosystem risk uh, came to light is the Terra ecosystem. So Terra Luna was a very famous uh, algorithmic stablecoin project. Um, they had a massive community and a lot of very uh, good builders that were backed by prominent VCs. Um, unfortunately, the stablecoin project collapsed earlier this year, and with that, a lot of its ecosystem was left scrambling, trying to redeploy code, go to new chains, kind of all that, right? So a lot of the hard work that they had put into it uh, gone down the drain, and a lot of the uh, VC backing that they had um, just kind of disappeared overnight as well. The fourth bucket, and I think this is probably one of the most unique to Web3, is token economics. And token economics, I mean, the role of the token in the Web3 space is just so, uh, it's just so fundamental, right? A lot of people talk about Web3 without the token, but it's, in our view, it's like hard to kind of separate one for the other. Um, and with token economics, you really need to understand the risks around, uh, first and foremost, incentive alignment, right? So, uh, you know, uh, one, one big topic, when people say token economics, a lot of times what they're talking about is how is the token distributed? Is like 50% going to the team, 10% for the community, 20% to early investors, right? So the breakdown of the allocation is kind of the first thing you want to check for and understand. And if the incentives aren't properly structured, it gives the team or the investors or the community an excuse to kind of dip out early, right? So if there's no sort of cliff, cliff vesting, meaning that it requires like a minimum of a one or two year wait before the tokens are unlocked for the investors or the teams, um, you know, a lot of times what teams do is they'll have kind of like a monthly vest for a year or two. They'll be building a product for that year or two, and then as soon as their uh, token unlocks, exit liquidity, sorry, things didn't work out, you know, it's, uh, they give up and walk away. And I think also the same for their investors, right? So if you wanna, uh, you know, if teams are getting people on their cap table, are those, are those folks on the cap table actually serious? Are they gonna stick around with the team? Are they okay with longer term vesting periods or are they just kind of looking for a quick flip as mo most Web3 investors are? Uh, next is really understanding what is the utility token, uh, the utility of the token. So most tokens are, are useless, quite frankly. Um, most teams don't have actual sustainable demand models built in. They don't really give the community much share into the token, so the token is kind of concentrated in the hands of the teams or VC. And so long term, if there is just token selling and not much reason to buy the token, 
price is going to go down, right? So, you know, I think uh, a lot of teams don't think about this. They don't, they just kind of token is like an afterthought. Let's build the product and let's add the token on. But really, what is the utility and how is it going to work? Uh, and then finally, there's some design flaws, right? So teams may be trying like very novel uh, token models, uh, you know, never before tested, has like some crazy burn 20% mechanism every single time. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, really understanding like what, where is that in, in the maturity of the token model design and is the implementation of that going to be proper or is it going to be improper is, is important. So, you know, definitely benchmark the token model that the team has. Is this something that's been proven time, time and time again? Or is this something completely new and, you know, who knows how the mechanism is actually going to work or if the design is going to work? Um, verify on chain. So, a lot of times teams, uh, they'll have some initial distribution strategy. So, they'll say, like, you know, only the team only gets 10% and it doesn't invest for two years. But they'll program that logic within the smart contract and they can actually manipulate that, right? They can make it so that, you know, they're saying one thing, but in reality, the smart contract is performing another thing. And so that's where we say you have to verify on chain or understand, you know, are they using some third party tools for the distribution that will help kind of hold them accountable? Um, and then finally, understand, you know, what is, what, is the, what is the value of the token, right? So like, what is the actual demand? Where is it coming from? So a lot of times what we like to do is kind of map out the token value model, right? So, you know, tokens are used here, they're bought here, they're sold here, they're sold here, and then you can do some uh, basic projections of like if X amount is sold on a daily basis, you know, what is the required mecha demand mechanism that needs to be in place to keep some sort of stability. Um, so this is all very new still within Web3, and I think a lot of token models haven't been proven, but something that is evolving every day and I think interesting to keep up with. Uh, so a time where token models uh, went wrong is a project known as Titan Finance. Uh, so Titan was an algorithmic stablecoin, um, and famously, uh, Mark Cuban lost $5 million investing in this project without doing any, any of his due diligence. Um, so they, they launched with a dual token model uh, design, kind of similar to how Terra Luna was uh, before, but as soon as the token launched, uh, I think three days later, it was proven that the token model that they had come up with, that was their revolutionary concept, didn't work and immediately went to zero. Investors lost all their money um, and just kind of crashed and burned. And finally, uh, community. So as I mentioned before, community is a very important part of Web3 and something that should be factored into the due diligence process, as simple and kind of funny as that may sound. I think it's uh, very critical to dive into a project's Telegram, into their Twitter, understand, you know, is their community actually bought in or are they bots? Um, so, you know, I think having a fake and fickle community, we have some tools that we use in-house where we're able to analyze like a project's Twitter following, for example, to understand how many of these Twitter followers are actually real versus how many of them are bots. And like, I would say minimum of 80% of followers for the average Web3 project are just bots or they're like, bought and paid uh, for, right? So, you know, don't be tricked by those mechanisms, kind of verify those for yourself. Um, understand, like, what is the level of engagement that the founders are trying to have with their community? So, some of the best teams that we've seen, or the most successful long-term projects, actually have active engagement, they're transparent, uh, they're open on their social channels, you know, they'll publish, like, weekly updates on their blogs. And so that gets the community bought in, and it gets kind of a core user base excited and feel like they have skin in the game and they're part of the process. And that's also where sort of the token distribution comes from, right? Are the users and the community going to be properly incentivized to stick around with you and like actually uh, be engaged in the project and help you grow? Uh, and then finally, looking at organic growth. So do they actually have organic growth plans? You know, is um, are they just running like win $100 campaign to get their new users, uh, you know, numbers pumped up? Or are they actually um, finding ways to get their users bought in, organic growth, kind of putting out their messaging, doing the work and, uh, and seeing and kind of seeing that. So, you know, what we recommend for investors, don't be fooled by a project that may have really cool tech, but has like a low social following or, you know, isn't that popular on Twitter or whatever, right? Um, a lot of times that's actually a sign of a project building uh, underground or like kind of building in stealth mode. And then a lot of times they can have more community plans uh, later on down the line. So just understand that and understand, you know, exactly how um, they're planning to engage and activate their community down the line. 
Uh, so a case study about this, um, NFTs. So there were some studies done and around 40 to 50% of all NFT volumes are fake. They're, it's called wash trading. Um, and a lot of times, like you'll see these NFT communities, even some of the most famous ones, say we have billions of dollars uh, traded on a daily basis, we have so many users, we have so, you know, so many people changing hands and so much demand, um, but most of the time, uh, that's, you know, it's, it's not legitimate. Or what they'll do, and this has become very famous, especially during the 2021 bull run, is you'll get social media influencers uh, pumping a token, getting kind of the community numbers up, but in reality, once you kind of look behind the curtain, it's like, okay, these are kind of short-term people, not the type of community members that you actually want, right? It's better to have 20 to 30 core community members that are active building, kind of promoting messaging than to have 10,000 uh, you know, members that came from an influencer um, that may not really care about the project. Uh, so I guess at a high level, that's um, the evaluation framework. And uh, quickly, I'll just kind of talk about uh, what Certic is building and how we're kind of helping address uh, a lot of these core categories. Um, so as I mentioned, we are kind of an end-to-end -end cybersecurity company with, for the Web3 space. So you know, everything that we're trying to build out is to address all of these needs that I laid out and, and some more. Um, so first, starting with uh, audits. Um, so our audit process is uh, very advanced. Um, you know, we do about 300 audits every single month, reviewing over 5 million lines of code. We have over 100 uh, audit engineers that have been around with us for the last four or five years, so really kind of seen the evolution of the crypto life cycle. And auditing historically is a very manual process, right? So it's one engineer kind of reviewing code, but what we're building out and what our founder is kind of rooted in um, is uh, automating the audit process to the extent that's possible, right? So our auditors not only review code, but they also build tools and they build systems that help us to expedite the audit process, you know, remove kind of the human error element out of the process. And so we have dedicated teams in-house that all they're doing kind of day and night is building out this tooling. Uh, we're utilizing a technology method known as formal verification. So our, our founders are professors from Yale and Columbia, and they were kind of the, uh, the, the fathers of the formal verification processes. So we're kind of bringing that into Web3. Um, and through that, we're trying to make provable ways to verify that your smart contract is secure rather than just having a human kind of read through it and verify that. Uh, we also do traditional kind of penetration testing. So, you know, this, uh, you know, our pen testers have worked for a lot of kind of leading white hat institutions and um, are able to assess, again, the non-Web3 elements of the security code. Uh, next, I'll talk about a system we built called Skynet. So audit is a static process, right? You review the code before it's deployed on chain. But what we saw is there's a massive need for on-chain security, and that's where Skynet comes in. So after smart contracts are deployed on chain, Skynet does 24-7 coverage of these smart contracts to understand, you know, is there any sort of vulnerabilities kind of being exploited both on-chain and off-chain, right? So it ingests a ton of different uh, on-chain and off-chain data from social data, um, to on-chain metrics, performance metrics, market liquidity, uh, all that. And we have some algorithms that we've built in so that if we can detect any sort of kind of hack happening in real time inside a mempool, for example, um, that we can quickly respond to that and get in touch with the team and find ways to alleviate the hack or minimize uh, responses. There could be, as I mentioned, Oracle manipulations that take place. That's something that Skynet is able to detect in real time if there's like some sort of pricing mismatch. Um, so that's, I guess, like at a high level what Skynet is intended for. Uh, next is our KYC verification. So KYC, most people know it as like a ID check that you do for, um, uh, for like an exchange. But what we've done is we've created an, a KYC process that's specific to crypto project teams. So what we do is teams typically, if they're anonymous, they wanna keep their anonymity. And so that's what our mechanism, our KYC is designed for. So it's a comprehensive background check on all team members. So not just an ID submission, but we do open source research. We try to understand, you know, who are these people? What's their background? Do they have any sort of criminal history? Is there any sort of adverse media? Can we actually prove that they're actually part of the project team? Um, and the, in the end, we provide that verification on behalf of the project. So we'll never dox the founders, we'll never dox the teams, but what we do is we work with VCs, exchanges, all that, kind of verify these individuals, and then we say, yep, this project is good to go, and they can stay anonymous, and we'll never kind of reveal their identity. 
Um, and also, increasingly, we're working on verifying that these teams are AML compliant, uh, GDPR, uh, as much as projects do take security measures to protect themselves, hacks do happen, rugs do happen, team member conflicts do happen. So our team of engineers are specialized in detecting these anomalies and reaching out to teams and working with them to minimize impact and risk exposure. Um, so we have monitoring right now across 10 different chains in real time. And we also have an, a Twitter account known as Certic Alert. It's free. Um, feel free to go on, subscribe, and you can kind of see all the hacks that take place uh, sort of in real time that we, that we notify the community for. And finally, we have our advisory unit. So our advisory team comes from more traditional backgrounds, uh, from the FBI, kind of traditional consulting firms, investment funds, but highly focused on the Web3 space. So you know, a lot of times we work with big institutions and investors to perform due diligence on their behalf and deliver these types of reports uh, on individual project teams. We can kind of do um, uh, advisory work on a case-by-case -case basis, right? If there's like a, a specific evaluation that investors need, bridge, bridging both that kind of like traditional consulting experience with the Web3 expertise uh, is where we focus on. And then uh, finally for our last two, we have our security leaderboard. So this is more of an open community platform um, where we have kind of a ranking system. You can get a lot of different types of information related to the security of a project. All of our audits are posted on there. So if you go on certic.com, uh, you can basically see all the projects we've worked with and then all their security metrics in real time. And finally, we have our Sky Harbor portal, which is for institutions and projects where we can communicate with them. They can get data metrics to understand what is the security of their portfolio companies, what is the security of their own, their own project, um, you know, wash trading, alerting, uh, on-chain analytics, cross-chain bridging, kind of all the insights that you would need. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you.